um, while I get set up here. How many folks is this your first um, DevOps Days event? Oh, quite a few, quite a few. Um, I've been to a number, this is my, uh, my first time in Singapore, much less my first um, DevOps Day in Singapore, but I've been to a few in Europe, um, in a few different cities, and I quite like this event compared to other conferences, because it's um, kind of more closer in a way, and um, also the way the open spaces works is quite nice, because you get a, we get a chance to have conversations, um, so rather than kind of doing Q&A, um, back and forth, it's kind of uh, a lot of interactions between people to have conversations about things. So I, um, I found it a really good experience. I've, I've really enjoyed them. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is around automation. So one of the common themes you hear in DevOps, uh, in DevOps days and other DevOps things is that DevOps is around culture. It's not around tools. And yet um, automation is still one of the kind of key enablers, one of the the things that helps us um, to work together. So I think it's, um, it's interesting to explore a little bit why do we do automation. Um, so first a little bit about myself. Um, uh, as, as you've heard, I work uh, for ThoughtWorks out of London. I've been working for ThoughtWorks for about seven years. Before that, um, I guess overall my, I've been about kind of 20 or so years in IT and working across development and operations roles. And at ThoughtWorks what I do is uh, we tend to go into organizations to help them um, learn how to do, uh, deliver software more effectively using agile approaches, lean, continuous delivery, these kinds of things. And I've tended to get involved in engaging with operations teams. And one of the things I found was that people were using um, the technologies for automation and cloud, uh, but they weren't necessarily adopting the practices that a lot of the more effective organizations were doing. So that was kind of... Um, one of the more interesting topics to me, which is why I, I wrote the book to kind of share what I learned, uh, mostly what I've learned from other people and what I've kind of tried out from learning from other people. So as far as cloud and all these kind of automation things go, the question is, what benefit are we expecting to get from these? Now, is it, in, in some cases, particularly in management, there's this idea that maybe we're going to save money by having fewer people or that we're going to have um, people who are maybe need to be less experienced, less skilled, and so we can save money, you know, save costs that way. I'll talk a little bit at the end about my kind of thoughts on that. Um, other things people um, think about is be able to to be able to scale more quickly, especially if we need to scale the organization in terms of the amount of different things that we're doing, different teams using systems, or just the size of things that, that automation uh, can help us do that. Um, maybe to make fewer mistakes. So if you have fewer manual tasks that people are doing by hand, um, you know, the, the less mistakes people are going to make and the smoother things are going to go. But I think, um, well, just, just, let's, let's, let, I'll tell a story back in the 1980s from automobile manufacturing. So the American automobile manufacturers back then, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, uh, they were really struggling, they were really suffering, and they were being um, overtaken in the market by Japanese manufacturers. And so um, this is a big concern for them. The Japanese companies were making cars more cheaply. Um, they were able to respond to the market more quickly, so they were making cars that people liked better and were buying more of. And so the American, this was a big crisis for the American automobile industry. And so what they did is managers went to, from the American companies, went to Japan and did tours of factories and have a look. So what is it that the Japanese companies are doing that's so effective? And what they saw when they first went was, what well, was automation, right? So they had all these factories and they, they said, oh, look, they have these machines and robots doing all the work and, the, and fewer people. So that's how they're doing it. That's how they're saving the cost. And that's what we need to do. So they went and invested billions and billions of dollars in automating their own factories, um, thinking that would help them out. And it turned out that didn't work. Um, they actually lost even more money because they had spent even more money. Um, and so they had to go back. And kind of over the years since, I think we've, we've explored more about uh, what companies like Toyota have done with the Toyota production system. And we've kind of uh, come around to the whole lean manufacturing thing and realized it goes a bit deeper. So what had happened to the American companies um, was the way that they were manufacturing cars before um, automating was they would um, basically produce like a batch of say 20,000 cars, all of the kind of same model, the same configuration, and then they would retool and they would produce another batch of some you know, thousands and thousands of cars and they would kind of produce these batches and put them in lots and wait to see if they sold and if they didn't sell then they lost loads and loads of money. And so what they did when they automated was exactly the same thing. So what the Japanese companies were doing, what the Lexi Toyota were doing, were 
um, using automation to be more flexible to say that actually we don't need to produce massive batches of cars that are all the same. We can actually kind of retool as we go along so that the, each car that comes off the line could be a different configuration uh, from the car that was before it. And so this means we don't need to build up those big inventories which are a risk you know, of, of, of uh, losing money if we can't sell them. And so um, the, essentially I see this kind of parallel to what's going on with automation today with cloud uh, with things like Puppet and Chef and, and, and all these kind of tools. Uh, that companies are adopting the tools thinking it's going to get them something, but they're not changing how they work, and so they're not seeing the benefit. Because uh, it really is about using the automation to enable continuous change. And so this is um, kind of my, my thesis is that uh, the reason we automate is to enable change rather than to save costs or anything else. Th there might be some things that come as a side benefit, but this is the key point. Because organizations want to go more quickly. They want to um, get you know, time to market more quickly, respond to, to needs. Particularly, so a lot of the clients I work with in the UK are retailers, media companies, increasingly finance companies, um, who are feeling threatened by these kind of digital native companies. So they're threatened by Amazon, by Google, and so on. And they're trying to figure out how can we adapt, how can we um, do what those companies do. And so, again, we're seeing this repeat of, of what happened with the automobile industry, of people looking at the trappings of the technologies and saying we need to adopt the technologies in order to, to be able to compete effectively. But the problem is that there's, there's still risk. So if we're trying to go very fast, even with these technologies, um, we run the risk of, of, uh, you know, of, of having errors or having problems. And so we need to figure out how do we balance these? Because there is this perception that we have, uh, the kind of intuitive idea that you have to choose between either going quickly or going safely and correctly and properly. And so to a lot of companies who are adopting Agile and DevOps and these kind of things, they kind of assume these mean abandoning quality, right? That Agile means you don't test, you just kind of rush things as fast as you can into production and don't worry about things, you know, move fast and break things. Um, but the reality is that companies that are very effective uh, at IT actually managed to do both. How many people are familiar with the uh, state of the DevOps report? So I'd hope at this conference, yeah, okay, quite a few. Um, so I think that what the really interesting finding from this for me was that those companies which are most effective um, in terms of financial performance and also in terms of, um, uh, let's say, fewer failures, fewer failure rele failed releases and less time that their staff spend on remediation, on fixing things, uh, and dealing with issues, um, the companies that were really good at that were also the ones that were releasing the most frequently, which is kind of counterintuitive. We assume that you have to go slowly and carefully in order to, to get that level of performance, but it turns out the opposite is true. So I think about it as the difference between Iron Age and Cloud Age uh, of managing our IT. So in the Iron Age, obviously, was when we had physical hardware, and that was the basis that we worked with. Um, so in terms of provisioning, um, or impl implementing a change with, um, when I was managing uh, based on physical servers, if somebody asked me and said, I need, a, I need a new server, I need an environment, that meant I had to go out and do purchasing. I had to go out and order a bunch of hardware, wait for it to be shipped to me. Um, then we'd have to go and we'd have to assemble it, um, you know, manually install the operating system and other software onto it, take it down to the data center, put it in the racks, cable it up. So it was weeks, right? It took weeks in order to, uh, provision a server, and if we needed to make a change, it was a very long time as well. Whereas with the cloud, and I want to be clear when I'm talking about the cloud age, um, it, it doesn't require the literal kind of public cloud, the Azure, Amazon, these kind of things. Um, you can also do these things with virtualization. You can even do them with physical servers where you're using things like Foreman uh, to automatically provision hardware. You can get the same kind of effect and the same benefits. So it's that kind of more the mentality and how you're using the technology. And so with these technologies, you can provision new servers in a very, very uh, you know, quick amount of time. And so this changes how we think about change. Um, in the Iron Age, if we had to make a change, so if I went through all that process of ordering the equipment and, and getting it into this, the, the racks down in the data center, and it turned out, we spin it up, and it turned out I actually I, I didn't have enough RAM in those servers, or the, the hard dr drives that I'd ordered weren't fast enough. Um, this was a mistake. This was a problem that I would have to go and explain to my management why I now need to go and ask for more money and have more delay in, in, in getting these things ready for them. And so change is a negative thing. 
Um, we need to change management. We need to change control. We need to change boards. So, so change is a negative thing and, and, and a sign of a mistake. Whereas if you can move very quickly to correct things and tweak things, it actually becomes an opportunity. It becomes a learning. So if it turns out that I needed more uh, RAM on those, on those servers that I provisioned in the cloud, well, that's fine. I can correct it and, and you know, just go and uh, make a change and, and maybe, at the worst, reboot a server. And, uh, and there we go. We have it, right? So that becomes lower cost. Um, and it becomes a good thing. Oh, now we've, we've learned how much RAM we need. Actually, maybe we need less. But, which back in the, the Iron Age, if it turned out that I'd ordered too much RAM, you know, that was it, right? I mean, I didn't tell anybody. I don't know, you know, we had too much RAM. But now we can kind of tweak it down and we can save some costs. We have an opportunity there that we didn't used to have. And so our processes that we use to manage change in the Iron Age is the focus is on the mean time between failure. How can we prevent anything from going wrong if at all possible? Whereas with the Cloud Age, we can think about the mean time to recovery. What can we do to optimize how quickly we can rebuild, fix, repair? That's not to say that we're choosing one over the other, that we no longer care about failures and we're not going to do anything to prevent them. It's just that, that kind of prioritization and the, the, the kind of old style process is to say that, uh, you know, oftentimes the mean time to recovery can be quite long because our process to fix things is so long. And so going back to that state of the DevOps report of, of why is it that the effective organizations are fast and more effective, I think it's because they can fix things more quickly. So if you have a change process that means uh, you notice something that's wrong with your systems. It's not critical, it's not broken right now, but you, you know, it's, it's maybe a technical debt or it's something that has a risk of going wrong later on. If it takes you several weeks and a lot of work in order to make the fix to that, if you have to go through filling out forms and, and raising tickets and, and um, going to change advisory boards and explaining why you want to make this, you don't bother to make those fixes as much. You just kind of put them on the list of here's our, our known issues, we know the things that are wrong, goes down to the backlog of technical debt. Whereas if you have a very effective process that can very quickly, I'm just going to go in and tweak that and run it through and it gets tested and, and, and goes into production quite quickly and safely, you fix things as a kind of a, a matter of routine. And so the overall quality of your system goes up and up and everything becomes more reliable. So the idea, what we're aiming for when we adopt these technologies is to lower our... Um, cost for change and the risk and the time that it takes to make a change from the Iron Age down to the Cloud Age very, very fast. What we find in a lot of organizations is that actually um, we still end up with it taking a really long time. We don't get all that order of magnitude of benefits. So for example, um, I'll work, uh, you know, I've talked with engineers who they've gone and implemented a private cloud with say OpenStack. And the engineer tells me, uh, you know, it used to take us uh, quite a lot of work to provision servers. Um, but now I can provision a server in 15 minutes, and it's, it's really quick, and that's great. But then I go and talk to the users, the people who actually need environments and servers created, and they say, it still takes six weeks for me to get a server, to, even though it's a virtual machine and it's on OpenStack. And that's because of the process. Is we're still using the old processes we used before, so in order to get that virtual server on OpenStack, I still need to fill out a bunch of forms justifying why I need it, what I'm going to use it for, and so on and so on. Um, and also maybe the process is that we, you know, we spin up in 15 minutes that server image, but then somebody has to, else has to come in and do configuration on it. So they have to set up the, the user accounts and security. Somebody else has to install um, packages, application servers. And so all of this kind of uh, means that we don't actually get the benefits. So it's the process that we haven't changed to take advantage of the tools. And often as well, there's risk. Again, going back to those companies who are trying to do this in order to, to adopt Agile and DevOps and become digital, um, sometimes they're either the, the processes that they have actually don't manage the risks that come with the technology very well, or they kind of abandon some of the, the, the processes and, and, and let people take shortcuts um, without something to kind of replace that. So there are actual risks, right? So when we talk about these things with the Iron Age and how slow it was, it's not that people were stupid, right? It's that there are actual risks and actual costs. Um, and you still need to manage those risks and those costs in some ways. So, so this is kind of, you're not really getting the cloud age, you're getting more of a kind of failed attempt at cloud age when you do this sort of thing. So what we want to get to is where we really are um, in a cloud age way where we, we're reducing the technical um, impediments and cost in order to do work, um, but we're also finding ways to have processes that can manage, effectively manage things that are also very quickly. And how do we do that? Uh, we do that by leveraging those technologies, those cloud age technologies, automation, 
you know, the automated testing and the continuous integration, continuous delivery, if we can leverage those in order to get good change control processes, um, then, then we're going to benefit, right? And this is what, again, Agile and DevOps and these kind of things are really all about. Um, they're kind of modern processes for, for managing risk and change. So some of the kind of uh, practices and, and, and things that we can bring to bear on this are um, obviously it's defining everything as code. So obviously our applications are defined as code already. Um, our infrastructure, if we're using things like Chef and Ansible and what have you, um, then our infrastructure is now defined as code, maybe Terraform, CloudFormation. Um, and then our tests themselves should be treated as code rather than, than things that people have to carry out manually for the, the routine and repeated tests. And the processes, so how do we deploy software? How do we control? So those things where we have gates, particularly in regulated industries where we'd have to have auditing and so on, how can we leverage the tools and, and, and make that defined as code so we can say, here are the requirements, here are the kind of acceptance criteria, here are the kind of fitness functions, um, you know, here are the security rules that have to be adhered to. How can we put, define that as code so that that can be uh, automatically managed? And so this, is, this, this lets us automatically test every change. So when we have things, I'm sorry, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm giving you a hard time here, aren't I, with the video? Um, um, yeah, so if, if you're, all of these things are, are defined as code, that means every time you make a change to them, that is a, a kind of a discrete, visible thing that you can manage. It goes into a commit, into source control, and therefore you can take action. It becomes an event. And, and again, it's not just the applications and the infrastructure, but if somebody changes the process, that becomes an event. There's a new change to our process, a new requirement we have. We can trigger our, our continuous integration um, to check our existing system against the new uh, requirement and prove that it's good before we move on and, and start making more changes. And so um, we want to have our, 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 our changes applied by our system. So if we're using tools um, like Chef or Ansible or Terraform or the kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, Azure resource management, these, these kind of things, we want to have the tools. Uh, we, we could use them uh, from our local kind of workstations and desktops and each of us runs them, but that runs the risk of, of, A, of inconsistency. You and I might have different versions of some of the tools on our laptops, and therefore we get different results when we run the process. Um, but also there's the, the issue that we might not do all the things that we need to do, so we might not run tests, we might skip some things because we think, oh, I don't need to bother with that for this change. And so that leads to um, not kind of enforcing overall our, our regime and our process that we've, we've automated, as thoroughly. So the idea is to use a continuous integration server, a continuous delivery server, and have changes, have the actual tools run on those. So you commit your change to source control, um, and then that triggers the server to actually run and execute the change on whatever environments, test environments, production environments they may be. And then we can promote those changes through environments, through a pipeline. So this is that delivery, uh, continuous delivery concept. And it's um, important to note that this doesn't mean um, so I think there's a perception, a common perception that continuous delivery means every time somebody pushes a change, a developer makes a change to the code, it kind of immediately goes through to production without any kind of oversight, um, which isn't necessarily the case. So you can design your pipeline to have um, kind of stages where somebody reviews changes before they go through, somebody approves changes, you record so that you get um, for those kind of compliance regimes where you need to have multiple people reviewing each change you can actually have your pipeline enforce that and record that and make that auditable and provable. So then how do we keep things consistent? Well, if we're provisioning servers and infrastructure as code, how do we make sure once it's out there and running over time and we're getting more and more servers running, how do we make sure that things keep consistent and keep well managed and updated? We want to avoid the configuration drift. So we want to avoid the situation where we've created a couple of servers and they've started out identical, but then over time, people have made changes here and there on different servers, maybe manually. Maybe they fixed an issue they found on one server, and they haven't had made the change on another server because that one didn't uh, need the fix. And so they end up with, with you know, servers that are inconsistent, that are not the same. And so when they try to run their automation tools, again, on these existing servers, they fail, or they work on some servers and not others. And that reduces our confidence in our automation, um, and which then leads us to, to more break our habits and say, I'm going to go and make changes manually because the, the automation tool tends to break. 
And so then, you know, it kind of becomes this downward spiral where we, we don't have the confidence to use our, our automation tools as, as thoroughly and consistency, consistent, consistently as, as, as we should. So a lot of this comes down to automation lag. So how long is the gap between running your automation tool um, on, the, on the kind of same environment? So if you only use your automation tool um, in order to make a specific change, so I need to upgrade Java on those servers, so I'm going to tweak my, my Chef cookbook and then run Chef as a kind of uh, uh, almost a manual activity or a manually managed activity against those servers. Um, that means that you know it's it's the it, if the next time around that I run it, the things might have changed, right? So you, you want to be running them continuously. So uh, Chef, for example, and, and and Puppet are designed to be run on a schedule um, every half an hour, every hour, whatever it may whatever it may be, even if changes haven't come in, so that it kind of reinforces. Uh, whatever's happening. So this idea of continuously synchronizing your configuration, regardless of whether it's changed, just to make sure that if something has gone on in the system, somebody's made a change to the system, or somebody's made a change to the automation, um, and that that might cause an issue that you found, find out right away, rather than maybe a week down the road, two weeks down the road, where things might have accumulated to become to the point where things break, and it takes too much work to correct them. So all of this stuff lets us do some interesting stuff or, and change our mindset towards design and architecture to say that rather than designing with an end state in mind, um, so this idea of saying we know where we are now over there on the left, um, we know we've, we've come up with this design for the end all be all, this is the final state of where we want to reach, um, and it becomes this big kind of project to get there. We can actually take things in kind of small chunks, and so we can say, okay, we know what our target state is, what we think it is. We can make one change to get us closer to there, and another change, and another change, and another change. And along the way, we may learn some things. We may learn that some of the assumptions that we made at the beginning actually weren't true. So maybe we didn't need some of the, the optimizations that we thought we might need. Maybe we added in caches um, or, or things like that in order to, um, to, to, to optimize what we assumed we would need to do to optimize the performance of the system. Actually, we find out as we go along, we do performance testing as we go along, and actually we didn't need that after all, so we can just keep our, our architecture simpler. And also by doing this, it forces us to design in a way that makes it easier to change. So this is the whole uh, idea be behind test-driven development, which is that if you're writing your tests as you write your applications, as you write your infrastructure, rather than saying, we'll write some tests later on once we've finished it, um, it actually affects your design. It helps you to design stuff so that it's easy to test, so it's easy to make changes to it. Uh, because in reality, you don't really get to an endpoint with your architecture and system design, because as soon as you've gone live with their, this is our, our, our big release, um, you need changes to it, right? You find that either there's things that you postponed that you didn't quite manage to fit into the release, or there's issues that you found that were maybe non-critical, but we want to go back, or you just start getting feedback from your users as they start to use it and say, can you add this, can you change this? So really, there is no end state for our system design, and so we need to, to um, embrace that mentality that things are constantly going to change, and that's a good thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the processes. So this is kind of around agile and, and this kind of thing, and continuous delivery and where we get to. So, because again, this is applied. This is kind of around the change management process, and so this is. Somewhat familiar for development, you know, most organizations are doing some kind of things around Agile for their software development, but fewer are doing it around infrastructure, <coughs> infrastructure architecture and how we, we change our infrastructure. Um, so it's going away from that kind of waterfall type process which is based around the idea of a release that we're going to, again, define this end state we want to get to and that we're going to wait until we've kind of implemented most of it and then we're going to do the activities to, to get it ready to release, which then becomes a, a large um, operation with, with um, high risk that we're going to find things that, that are incorrect and that it's going to take too much work to correct. So we kind of move to the, the, the sprint-based process, right? The kind of, this is the classic kind of scrum, what I call traditional agile, um, which is the idea that, yeah, you do some amount of planning at the beginning, but then you have your sprints, your iterations, and each of those becomes kind of a time-boxed uh, miniature delivery. Um, so even if you don't actually deliver to production on each one of those sprints, um, you're still doing a lot of the activities that you would normally have left, or you, would, you know, traditionally would have left towards the end of the release. Say so we're going to be testing as we go along so that we have less work to do towards the end and we have higher confidence um, in what we've produced before we get there. And so that's nice and that's a, an incremental... Sorry, was that a question? Or? Sorry. Um, 
so that's a good kind of progress. That's good progress. But kind of the next um, thing that we, we see people moving on to is more of a Kanban or story-based process. And that's, that's the idea that each story, so we assume that we, we kind of try to break down our, our work into stories that are going to take some number of days, not too long, in order to complete. And then each of these we're going to make sure, rather than waiting for the end of a sprint and a batch of stories to be, to be finished, we're going to do it story by story. Each story we're going to make sure the code, um, uh, the whole code base at that point is in a good quality and, 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 and good state that we could potentially release it. And so in this, as a kind of a, um, so, so different organizations go to kind of different, um, I guess, degrees of this. The kind of um, stronger version of Kanban is where after every story you release that into production uh, pretty much right away after having tested it, after having done whatever kinds of um, validation and maybe governance that needs to be applied to it. Um, and so that way, you, know, you, you, you don't build up this big batch of, of integration work, of testing work that has to be done at the end. You're just doing that continuously, which is great. And that can be moved on to actually a commit-based process. And this is the kind of continuous delivery and the true sense of continuous delivery is the idea that you make sure, you know, as you commit your changes, you, you, you take your story that you're trying to build and you make changes that work towards that story. And you make sure that each change kind of leaves the code base in a good condition um, to where it is usable. If the story that you're working on isn't finished and isn't suitable for people to see, you do things like feature hiding or feature toggling so that the code base, all the code is there, it's just that maybe it's not necessarily made available to users. Um, and so what this does is this really decouples the release process from the development process. So rather than telling the business, the people who are funding um, the development work and have the requirements, rather than telling them that we will release based on our development process, our, um, you know, our operations schedule, you know, our technical concerns no longer drive when we release. We can release any time you want. And it's actually not disruptive to us as a team. We don't need to stop development work. And we don't need to allocate a bunch of people from operations to spend a couple of weeks doing all this work to make your release. It's just fine. We'll just push the button because it's the same button in our pipeline that we've pushed for the previous environments. We know it, how it'll work. And we're, we're very confident. And so just, just go ahead and do it. And, and it, you know, call us if something goes wrong with it. And we'll come and have a look at it. So the kind of final thing. Um, I'll talk, I want to talk about is, is going back to this idea of, of the people and, and can we use automation uh, to cut costs to you know, reduce our staff or whatever it may be. And I think, <coughs> um, to my mind, um, the answer to that is, is, is rarely. Um, so I think this idea that, so, so we, get, we often get asked um, by companies to come in. You guys are experts in automation, automated testing, and automated deployments, and, and infrastructure, and so on. So can you come in and build us an automated system, and then we'll hire some people, uh, maybe some, some uh, graduates, recently graduated students, who will, um, they can just push buttons, right? You can build the system so that all they have to do is push some buttons, and it will run itself. Um, and so that'll be much cheaper for us. Um, or they hire a vendor to come in and install something like, say, uh, uh, you know, a PaaS platform. Um, uh, like Cloud Foundry from the, the Pivotal folks out there. And again, it's like, you know, have the vendor come in and install the software for, for us, um, and then they can go away and it will just kind of run itself. And the reality of, of, of things in the, the current, at least, state of the industry is that that doesn't work, right? It actually takes a lot of um, expertise and understanding of the system in order to maintain it and to keep it upgraded, to keep it patched, and to keep it to the, the, the point. So if you, like, leave a, you install software and then leave it for a year, um, and then you, you want to add some feature to it, chances are you can't because it now has things which are no longer supported, are known to have security holes and that kind of thing, and so you're going to have to um, have a fairly major effort to upgrade. And so you really need to have in your in-house an understanding um, of your automated systems um, so that you can carry out maintenance without having to rely on vendors like us or, or the, the, the product vendors or whoever it may be. You know, sure, bring us in if you have some particular um, uh, you know, difficult change or interesting thing that you need help with, uh, but you need to have that in-house. So even when it comes down to, uh, again, if you have somebody coming and installing a PaaS or a, a, you, know, um, you know, some kind of automated system for you, a vendor to do that, I tend to recommend people not to have the vendor do the installation, but have the vendor tell your people how to do the in in installation and to support them in doing that and you know, give them the, the help they need so that they can carry it out themselves and learn by doing. Um, and then that, that'll put them in a much better position to be able to support and maintain the system going on. So really the purpose of automation um, is to empower your people. When you, when you think about a system, the system is not an autonomous system. 
Um, it might be self-healing to some degree, but really the, the, the ingredient you need in order to have a really effective system is the humans. Um, so you think about how to use automation in order to make people's jobs easier, um, to make it so that activities that go on, whether it's debugging things or doing releases, um, become less about carrying out rote routines or so they're spending less time on things like carrying out the same tasks over and over again, provisioning servers, um, and they can spend, so, so going back to those kind of teams, you, you, a lot of times I see organizations where they have a team of people who provision servers, like the Linux team. The Linux team's job is they take tickets and they create servers for people and configure them for people, and that's kind of a boring job to do over and over again. Um, but what you really want those, those people to do is to maintain the automation system so that servers can be provisioned automatically and all the right things happen. And so rather than having somebody go through a checklist and, and installing and configuring things just right, they look at this, the scripts, they say the Packer scripts or what have you that build the server images and so that they know that every server we create um, is compliant and secure and, and, and has the right packages on it, the right versions of things on it um, without having to actually manually turn a, a, a handle uh, on everything themselves. So that's pretty much what I've, uh, what I've got to say on this for now. I'm happy to talk about things in the kind of open spaces this afternoon. Um, but I've just got some, some books to recommend. These are things that, uh, some of these are things that inspired me um, when I was writing my book or before, you know, and working along and, and things that have come out since that I, I think are quite good. Um, we'll, um, uh, I think, try to we'll publish this probably on SlideShare um, so that you can have a look at it later on if, uh, you know, if you want to have a look at some of these books. Thanks a lot and enjoy DevOps days.